We are at the end of our journey together through the book of Genesis. I cannot believe it. It's been an incredible study and we're so grateful that you have joined us week by week as we journey through these stories and the lessons that we can learn for us today. On the panel with me is my family, your family at home as well. To my left, Pastor John Denzi, delighted to have you here. It's a blessing to be here. Depending on God's grace, I'm going to cover Monday, Jacob settles in Egypt. Amen. Shelly Quinn, the lady in the middle, so glad you're here. I'm pleased. I love this lesson because it's all about the prophetic insight of Jacob when he blesses Joseph's two children. Oh, wonderful. To your left, Pastor Ryan Day, so glad you're here. Amen. I'm excited to be here. And I have Wednesday's lesson in which Jace, uh, Jacob blesses his sons. Mm. Amen. Last but not least, Pastor James Rafferty on Thursday's lesson. Delighted you're here. So good to be here. And I do have Thursday's lesson, the hope of the promised land. Amen. Pastor James, would you pray for us as we sure. open up? Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you again for this great quarter in the book of Genesis and all the amazing insights you've given us that show us what practical Christianity looks like mm -hmm. and how our hearts are touched by your heart, your grace, your mercy, and then that that flows out from us to others. Sometimes it takes time and we've seen that in the yeah. experiences of your people through the book of jo uh, Genesis. And now as we finish it up with Joseph, we recognize that there's reconciliation in our own lives that can bring us joy and happiness and peace and that can bring joy and happiness and peace to your own heart. So Amen. speak to us through these last chapters, we pray, and those who are viewing, and we pray in Jesus' name, amen. 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 We're at the end of the quarter. This is lesson number 13. And it seems like every time I read a book of the Bible, God shows me something different. And I believe as I've been studying, we've been studying together this time, I've really been impressed with the love of God through the book of Genesis. We see God's love in creating man and woman and this earth for us to enjoy. We see God's love in extending free will to us. We can choose to follow him or we can choose to reject him. We see God's love in the promise of redemption, that messianic promise, Genesis 3, 15, with the seed, capital S, the Messiah, who would come and redeem us from this world of sin that we are in. We see God's love in preserving a remnant from the flood and the rainbow of promise, that covenant mm. of preservation. We see God's love in entering into covenant with Abraham and extending promises of land and descendants, the coming seed, the Messiah to Abraham and his descendants. We see God's love in spite of humanity's mistakes and the mess ups that we have discovered through these, this journey, this saga. We see God's love and how he works redemptively in each person's heart and life. I think specifically of Abraham and how he transformed the man who was afraid to trust God with the promise of a son, became willing to sacrifice that son at the express command of God. I think of the transformation in Jacob's life, the man who by trickery and treachery, by cunning and deceit, sought to obtain spiritual blessings through carnal means. He wrestled with God and prevailed, learning utter dependence on God. I think last lesson we studied Judah and the transformation in his life, how he was a greedy man who sold his brother, he became willing to become a slave himself so that his other brother, Benjamin, could go free. The man who lived a sensual, pleasure-centered life became willing to deny himself pleasure, be willing to deny himself rights and personal freedom in exchange for his brother's freedom. You know what I see in the book of Genesis is a God who wants to work in humanity's life, reconcile us back back to the Father. That's what he wants to do in my life and in your life as well. This is part three of Joseph. We're looking specifically at Genesis chapters 46 through 50, the very end of the book of Genesis. And we pick it up with um, our memory text, Genesis 47, verse 17. 27, I'm sorry, Genesis 47, verse 27. So Israel dwelt in the land of Egypt, in the country of Goshen, and they had possessions there and grew and multiplied exceedingly. On Sunday's lesson, we have Jacob goes to Joseph. Now I have renamed this lesson, Answers to Prayer at 130. Have you ever <laughs> waited a very long time wow. for God to answer a prayer? Think about Jacob. 
we discussed, Shelley brought out, separated 22 years wow. from his mm. son Joseph. 22 years thinking his son was dead. Mm. 22 years mourning that loss. And then discovering at the end, this was the end of Shelley's lesson last week. This is the end of Genesis 45. Uh, verse 28, Israel said, it is enough. He discovers all of a sudden, Joseph, my son, is alive. I will go and see him before I die. Mm. Are you waiting for God to answer a prayer in your life? The children of Israel waited and groaned under Egyptian bondage, and they prayed for deliverance. Hannah waited and prayed for a child, and she received Samuel. Elijah prayed and waited for rain, and it came with a deluge. Mm -hmm. Esther fasted and waited and prayed for three days for the king. The woman with the issue of blood, she waited 12 years for healing. The blind man from John 9, he waited from birth for healing. The disciples, they waited 120 days in the upper room for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. What are you waiting on? Mm. Psalm 27, 14, wait on the Lord, be of good courage. He will strengthen your heart. We wait on God for strength. Psalm 145, 15 and 16, the eyes of all look expectantly to you. You give them food in due season. We wait on God for provision. 1 Corinthians 4, verse 5, therefore judge nothing before the time until the Lord comes who will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and reveal the counsels of the hearts. We wait on God to reveal hidden things and situations and what is happening. Titus 2, 13, looking for that blessed hope in the glorious appearing of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We wait on the second coming of Christ. Psalm 33, verse 20, our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and shield. We wait on God to help us and protect us. Jacob waited 22 years, and the answer to his prayer arrived when he was 130 years old. Joseph, his son, was alive. Mm. We're looking at Genesis chapter 46 specifically today. I've divided it up into three sections. God's promise, God's children, and God's reunion. So let's look at God's promise. We're in Genesis 46, verse 1. Israel took his journey with all that he had and came to Beersheba and offered sacrifices to the God of his father, Isaac. So Israel, Jacob, is leaving the land of promise, the land given to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Mm. He's going down to Egypt. And all of a sudden, God shows up and offers reassurance to him. We're in verse 2. God spoke to Israel in the visions of the night and said, Jacob, Jacob. And he said, here I am. So he said, I am God, the God of your father. Do not fear to go down to Egypt, for I will make of you a great nation there. I will go down with you to Egypt. I will surely bring you up again. Mm -hmm. And Joseph will put his hand on your eye. God reiterates the promise that he had made to Abram. You actually see a couple parallels that the lesson brought out, which I loved, between Abram's call and Jacob's call when he's leaving the land of promise, going into the land of Egypt. God told Abram in Genesis 12, what I will make of you a great nation. Mm. God's telling Jacob or Israel here right now, don't be afraid to go down to Egypt. I will make of you a great nation. Mm. God told Abram in Genesis chapter 15, do not fear. God told Israel right here, do not fear. So God is making a promise. He's leaving the land of promise, going into Egypt. And God's saying, I will be with you. Do not be afraid to go to Egypt. Mm -hmm. Now we look at God's children. And there's a whole bunch of genealogy going on here. We won't read that. Of those who went down to Egypt, it starts first with the children and grandchildren by Leah. And the Bible says there's 33 in all. Then it has the children and grandchildren by Zilpah, the concubine. There's 16. Then the children by Rachel. There's 14 in all. And in, uh, interestingly, I guess I never processed or remembered it before. Benjamin had 10 sons. That's a great deal of children. Mm. Then we have Bilhah. And the children uh, descendants would be seven. Now, the persons of the house of Jacob were 70. 70 indicates totality. All of Jacob's family went down to Egypt. 70 indicates all nations. The destiny of all nations is really at stake in this journey. Now, interestingly, if you read Acts chapter 7, Stephen's defense, he actually says 75 people went down to Jacob. Mm. 
Mm. Went down to Egypt. So that's interesting because when I read it, it says 70. And Stephen says there were 75. Mm. He was a Greek believer. He would have studied the Greek Septuagint. And the Greek Septuagint mentions 75 names instead of 70. Mm. So regardless of that, Jacob and his entire household went down to Egypt because the seed of Abraham it's important for all of us what happens with the children of Israel because through them will come the Messiah or came the Messiah because that would be past tense now. Mm -hmm. Now let's look at God's reunion. This is the last section. We're in Genesis 46 verses 28 through 34. And this is very interesting to me. If you pick it up in verse 28, I'm sorry, Genesis 46, 28. Then he, that's Jacob or Israel, sent Judah before him to Joseph. Now you see Judah almost taking on some of those firstborn rights. You see that. We studied last uh, lesson about the repentance of Judah. And now he's taking on what the firstborn, he's going ahead of them. Mm. He's going to Joseph to point out before him the way to Goshen, the best land of Egypt. And they came to the land of Goshen. So Joseph made ready his chariot and went up to Goshen to meet his father Israel. Can you imagine? 22 years, not knowing if your father was alive. We often focus on Jacob's grief, do we not? Mm -hmm. He thought his son was dead and he's grieving the loss of his son for 22 years. But Joseph has been in exile. Joseph has been a slave and now elevated to one of the second in command position there in Egypt. But Joseph missed his father. And after 22 years, he's going to see his father again. He made ready his chariot and went up to Goshen to meet his father Israel. And he presented himself to him and fell on his neck and wept a good while. Mm. And Israel said to Joseph, now let me die since I have seen your face because you are still alive. Mm. We see the answers to prayer for both the father and the son, mm -hmm. after 22 years of separation, they are brought back together. They are reunited. Mm -hmm. Answers to prayer at 130. What was lost is restored. Mm. So I don't know what you are praying for today. Have you waited a long time for the answers to those prayers? Are you wondering, where is God? Why isn't he hearing me? Do not lose heart. Amen. Do not give up mm -hmm. because your God, our God loves to hear and answer prayers. Mm -hmm. And our God wants to work redemptively in each person's heart and in their lives. Amen. 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 Well, we now move to Monday's portion of the lesson. My name is John Dinsey. And the title of the lesson is Jacob Settles in Egypt. And this uh, Monday's portion takes us into chapter 47 of the book of Genesis. But I need to make reference to chapter 46, uh, verse 34, because uh, this sets up the stage for chapter 47. Notice that it says, Then ye shall say, Thy servants are men that have been occupied with cattle, from our youth, even until now, both we and our fathers, in order that you may dwell in the land of Goshen, for every shepherd is an abomination to the Egyptians. Mm. And this is what Joseph told his brothers that he would present before the Pharaoh to say. Uh, now, there's a reason why this uh, counsel is given by Joseph to his brothers, and we're going to look at that in a moment. But here in Genesis chapter 47, uh, verses 1 through 6. Let's read that quickly. Then Joseph went and told Pharaoh and said, My father and my brothers, their flocks and their herds, and all that they possess have come from the land of Canaan, and indeed they are in the land of Goshen. They could not survive if they stayed in the land of Canaan. And he took five men from among his brothers and presented them to Pharaoh. These brothers are not named. Then Pharaoh said to his brothers, What is your occupation? They were ready to answer according to what Joseph told them. And they said to Pharaoh, your servants are shepherds, both we and also our fathers. Notice the respect they present to the Pharaoh. Your servants <laughs> are, are shepherds. And they said to Pharaoh, we have come to dwell in the land because your servants have no pasture for their flocks, for the famine is severe in the land of Canaan. Now, therefore, please let your servants dwell in the land of Goshen. Then Pharaoh spoke to Joseph, saying, Your father and your brothers have come to you. The land of Egypt is before you. Have your father and brothers dwell in the best of the land. 
Let them dwell in the land of Goshen. And if you know any competent men among them, make them um, overseers or chief shepherd, herdsmen over my livestock. So here we have that this Pharaoh is wise. Wise because he's asking, take the cream of the crop from among your brothers and set them as herdsmen, chief herdsmen of my livestock. And so, you know, he's looking for talent. Mm -hmm. And if he sees talent in them, uh, if he, he puts Joseph in charge. Very interesting concerning the dreams that God gave to Joseph concerning his brethren. Dro Joseph at this, at this stage is over his, his mm -hmm. father and his brethren just as he had dreamed. Now the lesson brings out a quote from Ellen G. White's writings, Patriots and Prophets, that is uh, recommended for your reading. Mm -hmm. Uh, the whole book, actually, but let's look at page 233. 233, actually, the lesson brings out. Joseph took five of his brothers to present to Pharaoh and receive from him the grant of land for their future home. Gratitude to his prime minister, which was Joseph, would have led the monarch to honor them with appointments to offices of state. But Joseph, true to the worship of Jehovah, sought to save his brothers from the temptations to which they would be exposed at a heathen court. So this was the wisdom that God gave Joseph to say, say you are shepherds. Therefore, he counseled them when questioned by the king to tell him frankly their occupation. The sons of jo Joseph followed this counsel, being careful also to state that they had come to sojourn in the land, not to become permanent dwellers there thus reserving the right to depart if they chose. The king assigned them a home as offered in the best of the land, the country of Goshen. So we see here that God prepared a place for his children mm -hmm. in the land of Goshen. There they would be separated from the rest of the population where they could uh, avoid the evil influences that all of Egypt had. They were pagans. Mm -hmm. So they were there they could thrive and uh, have success. Now, uh, let's go here into Genesis chapter 47, verses 7 through 10. Uh, this is the time when Joseph bring his, brings his father Jacob before the Pharaoh. An interesting conversation takes place, very short, but this is what happened beginning in verse 7. Then Joseph brought his father Jacob and set him before Pharaoh, and Jacob blessed Pharaoh. Hmm, very interesting. <laughs> and Jacob said to Pharaoh that they... Uh, I'm sorry, verse 8, Pharaoh said to Jacob, how old are you? <laughs> I'm not sure what appearance Jacob had, but that prompted the question. <laughs> and Jacob said to Pharaoh, the days of the years of my pilgrimage are 130 years. Few and evil have been the days of the years of my life. And they have not attained to the days of the years of the life of my fathers in the days of their pilgrimage. Mm -hmm. So Jacob blessed Pharaoh, notice that, and went out from before Pharaoh. Very interesting uh, situation because you see the Pharaoh is supposed to be the high priest of his country. Mm. But so he's the one that's supposed to give the blessings. But here we have Jacob blessing the Pharaoh. And notice that Jacob didn't say as other people would probably before the Pharaoh, uh, long live the king or, or live forever thou Pharaoh. No. He recognized, it's very interesting, there's this uh, quote from Ellen G. White's writings I'd like to bring out to you, which is uh, very interesting, page 233. Not long after their arrival, Joseph brought his father also to be presented to the king. The patriarch was a stranger in royal courts, but amid the sublime scenes of nature, he had communed with a mightier monarch. And now in conscious superiority, he raised his hand and blessed the Pharaoh. Mm -hmm. That's so, Patriarchs and Prophets. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 233. Thank you. So this is uh, uh, Jacob recognizing his position as a prophet mm -hmm. and blessing the Pharaoh. And this is, remember the title of the lesson is Jacob in the Land of Egypt. But other things take place uh, there and that you have a description of how Joseph managed all the time, uh, some of the time of the years of famine. Remember, some time had passed even before his brothers had come. Now, the uh, Bible gives you a few details of how difficult this, this was. Beginning uh, here in Genesis chapter 47, verse 13. It says, now there was no bread in the land. Mm. Uh, 
For the famine was very severe, so that the land of Egypt and the land of Canaan languished because of the famine. And uh, uh, detail is given that as time passed, the people would come to Joseph and Joseph says, okay, uh, we will sell you for the money you have. After the money was gone, then uh, they said, well, we don't have any more money. Well, let's go, let's talk about the cattle you have. And so the cattle was sold to Joseph uh, so for the benefit of the king. And then they say, well, we don't have any more money. We don't have any cattle. All we have is our lives and the land. Mm. Okay, that's fine. Let's take possession of your land. Now, this is very interesting because back in those days, as you know, as kingdoms were, were forming, People would just come up on a spot. Hey, this seems like a good spot. Why don't we, why don't we settle here? And they would, la they would grow their crops and, you know, raise their animals. And they first come, first serve. This is my spot. And so the uh, Egypt did not necessarily own all the land at this period of time. So Joseph very wisely mm. purchases the land so that the kingdom or Pharaoh could be in control of the land. So what happens next? <laughs> they sold their, they have no money, they have no cattle, they have no land. Yeah. They say, well, we, the only thing we have is our lives. <laughs> and so he said, okay, <laughs> we'll, we'll take that too. And so uh, at this particular time, uh, the kingdom of Egypt owned everything. Mm. But notice that after a period of time, uh, Joseph, after he has all this, he brings seed to the people and says, you grow it and you keep uh, four parts and give one part to the Pharaoh. Now this secures, of course, for the kingdom, the, the things they need. And so it was very wise. Now you look at that and you say, it was like a fifth portion. You look at that and you say, wow, that seems like 20%, that's a lot. But back in those days, other, other kingdoms were charging 33%. So it's, it's, it's a reasonable offer. And you know what the people said? You have saved our lives. They were grateful. They were grateful because now he's also providing things for them. Uh, the time is rushing, so I have to go. Uh, I'm just going to go skip down to verse 27. When you get to uh, uh, verse 27 and onward, you see that Jacob asks or makes a request to Joseph and says, do not, please, do not bury me in Egypt. Uh, take me out of this place. And he wanted to be buried along with his fathers. Mm -hmm. So Jacob, the last 17 years of his life, he faced much toil. I didn't cover that part because he had few days. I mean, he, uh, he experienced a lot of trouble. The deceiver was deceived many times. Learned a valuable lesson, which is a lesson for us. If you practice deception, as you sow, you will reap. So I encourage you, follow the Lord, be faithful. And, you know, Jacob repented and the Lord blessed his latter years with peace. Amen. We see redemption again in that story. Don't go away. We will be right back. Ever wish you could watch a 3 Abian Sabbath School panel again? Or share it on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter? Well, you can by visiting 3abnsabbathschoolpanel.com. A clean design makes it easy to find the program you're looking for. There are also links to the Adult Bible Study Guide so you can follow along. Sharing is easy. Just click share and choose your favorite social media. Share a link. Save a life for eternity. Welcome back to lesson number 13, Israel in Egypt. And we'll continue with Tuesday's lesson and my sister Shelley. Oh, thank you so much for the foundation that you have laid. And I am Shelley Quinn. And this is Tuesday's lesson, Jacob blesses Joseph's sons. So what happens? Joseph comes, this is at the end of Jacob's life. Joseph comes to the bedside of his ailing father. And I mean, his lights are going out fast. His eyes are growing dim. He's uh, losing his strength. But he brings his two oldest sons, and that's Manasseh and Ephraim, to see their grandfather. Mm -hmm. And you know, it's interesting, as grandparents often do or somebody when they're about to die. Joseph summons the strength, I mean Jacob summons the strength to sit up in bed and here's the interesting part. You read in Genesis 47 9 the pessimistic report that 
Jacob made to Pharaoh when he said, how old are you? And he says, ah, the, the evil has been, few and evil have been the days of my mm. 130 years of my life's pilgrimage. But now as he approaches death, Genesis 48, let's look at verse 15. He's got a different evaluation of his life. He recognizes that every day was under God's control. So Genesis 48, 15, and he blessed Joseph and said, God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked, the God who has fed me all the day long, my life long to this day, the angel who is redeemed me. Now he's talking about the angel of the Lord with whom he wrestled and said, oh, I'm not gonna let you go till you bless me. This was the pre-incarnate Christ who changed Jacob's name. Mm. That was his biological name, but he changed it to the spiritual name Israel, one who has contended with God in one. And he says, so this angel with whom, or who has redeemed me, you know, this is the first mention of God as redeemer. Mm. Amen. Isn't that Amen. interesting? Mm -hmm. We go back and of course we think of, Genesis 3, 15, we use the word redeemer, but in the Old Testament, this is the first mention. He said, who's redeemed me from all evil. He said, bless the lads, the lads, his grandsons. Mm -hmm. Let my name be named upon them in the name of my fathers, Abram and Isaac, Abraham and Isaac, and let them grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. This is a covenant blessing. Yes. God made his covenant with Abraham. He renewed it with Isaac. He renewed it with Jacob. Mm -hmm. And so that's why he's called the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But you'll also hear, and the God of Israel. Israel can refer to Jacob, mm -hmm. but it is also mm -hmm. the uh, uh, nation that God renews his covenant with them at the Mount of Sinai. So verse five, oh, I'm going to back up. In verse five, the dying Jacob says to Joseph, now your two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, who were born to you in the land of Egypt before I came to you in Egypt are mine <laughs> as Reuben and Simeon. They shall be mine. He adopts his grandsons. Ephraim and Manasseh, who are now adopted, are going to receive the blessings of the first and second born in place of Jacob's first and second born sons who were by Leah. So, and that would be Reuben. Reuben is being displaced, if you will, because of his sexual sin with his father's concubine. And then Simeon, brought disgrace upon his father when he and his brother Levi uh, had talked, when, when their sister Dinah was raped, they talked their father, they conned him and told Jacob, have all the men of this village be circumcised. And that should have been a sign of covenant unity. And what they did is when all the men were oh. circumcised and laying around, then Simeon and Levi went in and slaughtered every man they massacred and this brought disgrace on Jacob. So Joseph, this is what I love. Joseph has his oldest son, Manasseh. He positions, I can't talk, but he positions him at Jacob's right hand because he wants him, he's the oldest, he wants him to get the firstborn blessing. Mm -hmm. Then he takes Ephraim and he positions him at Jacob's mm -hmm. left hand. But Jacob calls the boys near to him and before blessing them, he embraces them and he kisses them. Mm. Now I'm wondering, mm. at this point, don't you think Jacob is thinking, yeah, I went through this with my dad and I deceived him mm. and I took the firstborn blessing. Even when dad, you know, I had the fur on my arms and, mm. and all of this stuff mm. and, and my brother's clothes. But now what happens, Jacob is going to do something really unique mm. in a surprising way. Jacob takes his right hand mm. and puts it on Ephraim's head. He takes his left hand and puts it on Manasseh's. Mm. He's got them crossed mm. and Joseph doesn't like this. He tries <laughs> to correct his father and it's like, no, 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 no. 
Manasseh's the oldest, your right hand goes on him, Dad. You know, you're getting old and senile. But Jacob refuses. And here's what I believe. Mm. I believe it was prophetic insight mm. because Manasseh was going to become a leader of a tribe, mm -hmm. but God's hand was on Ephraim to be a leader of the nation. Actually, the, the 10 Northern kingdoms became known as Ephraim. Mm -hmm. And it, it, his position in history is so important that his name Ephraim became a substitute for Israel's Northern Kingdom. Let me give you an example. Jeremiah 31, 20. This is the Lord speaking. And he said, is Ephraim my dear son? Now he's not speaking of the boy, the son of who, I, I give him all these names, Joseph. Joseph. He's not speaking, he's speaking of the nation, the Northern Kingdom. See, when he, when God calls someone his son, this is a covenant term. Mm. So God says, is Ephraim my dear son? He's talking about covenant sonship. Is he a pleasant child? For though I spoke against him, against the Northern Kingdom, I earnestly remember him still. Therefore, my heart yearns for him. I will surely have mercy on him, says the Lord. So what we see here as Joseph brings his sons to Jacob to be blessed, Jacob has the insight. See, I believe all along Jacob was meant to get mm. the firstborn blessing because Esau was a rough character who mm -hmm. didn't put any value on God's blessings. Mm. So Jacob got, the first, he was the younger of the two, but God chose him mm -hmm. for firstborn blessings. Mm. And I believe God chose Ephraim for firstborn blessings. Mm -hmm. So we've got now Jacob, he's adopted these two boys and Joseph gets blessed because of this, mm -hmm. right? It's, it's increasing the portion to Joseph, but he's now praying for the creator God, the God of the covenant to identify with these children and for his, mm -hmm. his new sons to identify with God that they would not get into the Egyptian culture and their pagan religions. And Jacob promises Joseph that God would be with him, mm -hmm. that he would bring him back to the land of his fathers in Canaan. And here's an interesting point that the quarterly makes. It says, by referring, as Jacob is giving all of this, by referring to the experiences where God turns evil into good, Jacob expresses his hope mm -hmm. that not only will God take care of the present lives mm -hmm. of his grandson, just as he did for him and for Joseph, but he also thinks of the future when his descendants will return to Canaan. Mm -hmm. Jacob kept in mind the promises of God who said that through his family, all the nations of the earth would be blessed. Mm -hmm. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Thank you, Shelly, for setting it up nicely for me because she had Joseph's sons that were blessed by Jacob. And I have Wednesday's lesson entitled, Jacob Blesses His Sons. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I was, I heard someone say years ago, you know, the most important words are the, are the words of a dying man. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and in this case, Jacob is so the case in this, in, in this particular instance. Um, the, the lesson brings out pertaining to the verses that we're about to go through. This is Genesis chapter 49, verses 1 through 28. So we're going to take on almost the entire chapter. Uh, but the 49th chapter is all Jacob. He is going through each one of his sons and he's uh, declaring a truth about them and their character and of course ultimately ends up blessing them all. But the lesson brings this out that I think is important for us to understand because when we go through this, it's almost, you know, 
Jacob's almost like a poet when he's, when he's declaring these different truths pertaining to the character and the future, uh, you know, of, of, of his sons and their, and their descendants. It's quite interesting that, you know, you could take this literal and think, oh, he, he's declaring a truth about what these guys are going to do. But in this case, we have to understand that the, the lesson brings out, it says the text goes through the future line of each of these men, speaking of the sons of Jacob. These are not predestinated fates. So get that in your head. These are not predestinated fates as if God willed that each of these would face what they faced. Mm. Rather, they are expressions of what their characters and the character of their children would bring about. God's knowing, for instance, and he gives an example here, that someone will kill an innocent man is a radically different thing than God having willed that the killer do it. Amen. So it's just bringing about that this is not necessarily their fate or their future, but rather the character behind these individuals. Mm -hmm. So we're going to start in Genesis chapter 49, verses 1, or verse 1, and uh, he addresses his firstborn. Reuben first. And so notice what he says here in verse three. Uh, let's go. Let's start with verse one here. It says, And Jacob called his sons and said, Gather together that I may tell you what shall befall you in the last days. Gather together and hear you sons of Jacob and listen to Israel, your father. So you can imagine they're gathered together. They're listening because they know these are probably the last words of their father. And he addresses Reuben first. Reuben, you are my firstborn my might and the beginning of my strength, the excellency of dignity and the excellency of power. But then he says, unstable as water, you shall not excel because you went up to your father's bed. Then you defiled it. He went up to my couch. Then he moves on to Simeon. He says, Simeon, or actually Simeon and Levi. Notice how he brought those two together. He didn't address them individually, but you know, those two, you know, they, they kind of sealed up their history together when they did what they did uh, in the Dinah situation. Uh, so he addresses them together. He says, Simeon and Levi are brothers. Instruments of cruelty are in their dwelling place. Mm -hmm. Let not my soul enter their council. Let not my honor be united in their assembly. For in their anger they slew a man, and in their self-will they hamstrung an ox. Cursed be their anger, for it is fierce, and their wrath, for it is cruel. I will divide them in Jacob and scatter them in Israel. Mm -hmm. So far it doesn't sound like we're out to, up to a, a positive start here. It doesn't sound like much of a blessing. But as we get down to the end of this chapter, we'll see that he does end up blessing all of his sons. Because, you know, Jacob's a parent. Even though he's addressing the truth behind the characters of these individuals, mm -hmm. uh, this is some somewhat of a rebuke and a reminder of, of what they have done. And, you know, of course, the blessing that he's going to give later on is going to be a reminder of the man he wants them to become, you know, wants them to be. Mm -hmm. And in this case, I think any parent, no matter what the, uh, the, the faults or the, pa you know, previous past issues were with their children, all parents, I believe, good-hearted parents want their children to be blessed and they want them to, be, to prosper. And in this case, I believe Jacob's heart is in the right place. But nonetheless, he's not holding back. He's telling the truth about what these young men had done. Now he goes on to Judah. And Judah, uh, only second to Joseph, has the longest address. And in Judah's address, when we start reading through this, tell me, you could just, I can I'm almost see you nodding and nodding your head because as you, as you read through this, this is very prophetic. This is, this is a messianic prophecy, to be honest, because through Judah, we know, uh, would come Christ, the, the, you know, through the tribe of Judah. And so it's interesting here. Notice what it says in beginning in verse 8. It says, Judah, you are he whom your brother shall praise. Your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's children shall bow down before you. And then notice here, Judas is a lion's whelp. From the prey, my son, you have gone up. He bows down, he lies down as a lion and as a lion who shall rouse him. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet mm. until, notice, Shiloh comes. This is another word for shalom or peace, until peace comes. And to him shall all the obedience of the people, binding his donkey to the vine and his donkey's colt to the choice vine. He washed his garments in the vine, or in the wine, excuse me, and his clothes in the blood of the grapes. His eyes are darker than wine and his teeth whiter than milk. You know, all of this 
it is very messianic in, it just in the, in the very uh, words and the very expressions that he's using. This is speaking of Christ. This is speaking of the peace that would be brought through the lineage of Judah you know, from Jesus Christ himself. I was, as I was reading this, Isaiah 9 and 6, and I think the lesson even brings this out. Uh, Isaiah 9 and 6 and verse 7, speaking of Christ, that great messianic passage. For unto us a child is born, unto yes. us a son is given. Uh, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God. God, everlasting Father, Prince of, there it is, peace. Shalom or Shiloh, Prince of Peace. Mm -hmm. It goes on to say in verse 7, and of the increase of his government and peace, there it is again, and peace there shall be no end upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and justice. And from that time forward, even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Mm -hmm. And even the spirit of prophecy, just again, just making a simple uh, point to what we've just read about Judah. She says this in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 236. She says, as the lion, king of the forest, it is fitting symbol, or it is a fitting symbol of this tribe, which again came from David. And the son of David, Shiloh, the true lion of the tribe of Judah, to whom all powers shall finally bow and all nations render homage. So this was very prophetic. As Jacob is, is calling this out to Judah, we're, we're back here looking, or we're, we're forward looking back going, ah, this, this, was, this was very prophetic in how he was actually giving a messianic prophecy, speaking of Jesus Christ coming. Now he goes on to Zebulun, verse 13. He says, Zebulun shall dwell in the haven of the sea. He shall become a haven for ships and his border shall adjoin Sidon. Issachar is a strong donkey lying down between two burdens. He saw the rest uh, was good and that the land was pleasant. He bowed his shoulder to, the bear, uh, to bear a burden and became a band of slaves. And then he moves on to Dan. Uh, Dan, uh, you'll see in a few minutes when we get to Revelation, as I reference Revelation, Dan is removed from the list because Dan didn't go on to do what Dan was supposed to do. Mm -hmm. And so it goes on to say, though, Dan shall judge his people and one of the tribes of Israel. Dan shall be a serpent by the way, a viper by the path that bites the horse's heels so that its rider shall fall backward. I have waited for your salvation, O Lord. And then, of course, on to Gad. Gad, a troop shall tramp upon him, and he shall triumph at last. Mm -hmm. Bread from Asher shall be rich, and he shall yield royal uh, dainties. It goes on to Nephtali. It says, Nephtali or Nephtali is a deer let loose and uses beautiful words. This is very poetic as you're going through there. I mean, this, he, had a, he had a sharp mind in his, in his latter moments of life to be able to come up with these beautiful words. And then he moves on to Joseph. Joseph is a fruitful bough, a fruitful bough of, 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 a, of a well, excuse me, by a well. His branches run over the wall. The archers have bitterly grieved him, shot at him and hated him, but his bow remained in strength and the arms of his hands were made strong by the hands of the mighty God of Jacob. From there is the shepherd, the stone of Israel by the God of your father who will help you and the almighty who will bless you with blessings of heaven above, blessings of the deep that lies beneath, blessings of the breasts of the womb, the blessings of your father have excelled and blessings of my ancestors up, up to the utmost bound of the everlasting hills, they shall be on the head of Joseph and on the crown of the head of him who was separate from, separated from his brother. Joseph went through some stuff as we mm. have clearly stated, but now, you know, in his time of trouble, now in, in his father's latter days, as he's now coming all, out of all of that trouble and he's seeing his family reunited, he gets the perhaps the biggest blessing of all as you see the word blessed here, blessings, blessings, blessings being repeated because Joseph wanted to bless his son of which he was separated from for more than 20 20 years. And so in this case, he moves on to his youngest son, Benjamin. And it's quite interesting because Benjamin's, Benjamin's is interesting. As I said, Benjamin is a ravenous wolf. In the morning, he shall devour the prey. And at night, he shall divide the spoil. If I couldn't help it, but my mind went to 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. Uh, we're talking about Lucifer, right? The devil is like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. In this case, I don't think that necessarily applies to Benjamin. But it's talking about the strength, the power of Benjamin. And the tribe of Benjamin was, was certainly that. Uh, but then verse 28, and I'm running out of time here in, in, la in closing. It says, all these are the 12 tribes of Israel, and this is what their father spoke to them. And even though he had some negative things to say about some of his sons, here comes the blessing. It says, and he blessed 
them. He blessed each one according to his own blessing. Praise the Lord for that blessing because while those men had their own faults, their names would reach far and beyond all the scriptures even into the very last days where the 144,000 shall be spiritually coming out of those tribes, my brother. Amen, amen. amen. Thank you, Ryan. I'm uh, James Rafferty and I have Thursday's lesson, The Hope of the Promised Land. And I'm picking up right where Ryan left off. We're in verse 29 of chapter 49. And we're going to take it from verse 29 all the way through chapter 50. And I love what you were saying there. You know, God predicts, but God doesn't necessitate us fulfilling these descriptions. For example, Levi was scattered right. among the tribes. That was the curse that Levi and Simeon received. God turned that into a blessing when the Levites stood faithfully That's right. for the Ten Commandments, for um, Moses uh, there at Mount Sinai. And they were scattered still, but they were scattered as priests. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we don't need to um, see this as a negative. God right. many times reveals to us our character so that we can make changes through His grace Amen. so that we can be blessed through His grace. So, and then basically Jacob says, you know, he charged them, verse 39, 29, and he said to them, I'm going to be gathered to my fathers um, in the cave. I want to be buried in the cave in the field of Ephraim the Hittite. And this cave is in the land of Canaan. And this is, this is a powerful last wish. You know, you were talking, Ryan, about these last wishes, you know, mm -hmm. that we ask when we're dying and the most important things to us. Well, the most important thing to Jacob Jacob is that he would be buried in the land of Canaan, not in the land of Egypt, that he would be buried with Leah, uh, the cave that he purchased, verse 32. And this is really speaking to us in a sense of the promised land. You see, the literal land of Canaan was a symbol of the promised land, right. of the eternal inheritance that we are given mm -hmm. through Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And so basically what Jacob is saying to his sons is, listen, Egypt is providing for us right now and, and this is where we have to kind of hang out. This is where we have to be, you know, we have to kind of, but this isn't really our future. Right, right. This earth isn't really our future. Right. And this, this earth is temporary. And so we need to be thinking about Canaan. We need to be thinking about where we're going to end up and what God has promised to us. And I want our minds and our hearts to be there. God is going to bless us while we're here, but we need to be there. Mm. In fact, I love that because, you know, in the New Testament, Ephesians chapter 2, it says we're sitting in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And in uh, Hebrews 11, it says, we're strangers and sojourners on this earth. You know, and when you think about, you know, even Jesus talked in, in Luke 16, 8, he talked about how the, the, the people of this world are wiser than us. You know, when you think about, you know, Johnny, you were sharing this whole idea of the Egyptians, you know, first of all, they, they gave all their money and, and, and then they gave all their, their animals and then <laughs> they gave all their, their land and then they gave themselves and they were happy to do it because you saved our lives. And here, Jesus Christ has saved our lives. Amen. And not only for this, but for eternity. Good. And we kind of, sometimes we're kind of unhappy to do it, you know? We should be giving Him everything we have and everything we are, Amen. ourselves, our land, our, our everything. And be happy about it because He saved our lives mm -hmm. for all eternity. And this was what Jacob wanted to close out with. As he's mm -hmm. ending these blessings, he wants to remind them the promises of God. Amen. The promised land, mm -hmm. Canaan, that's where I want to be. Mm -hmm. That's where my heart is. That's, right. that's, where, that's where I want to be buried. And then it goes on. There are three points in this lesson that are really powerful. That's the first one. The lesson brings out this idea uh, of, you know, being buried in Canaan, which is a type of the heavenly. And then it talks about what happens when Jacob dies. What happens when Jacob dies basically is that the brothers uh, fear that Joseph hasn't forgiven them. Mm -hmm. And this is what happens, you know, when you carry guilt year after year after year, mm -hmm. you don't confess your sins, you don't give your sins to the Lord, you don't just let him have them and you carry that, mm -hmm. you have a hard time mm -hmm. believing that you're forgiven. Right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, I mean, Joseph forgave them before they even came. Really, he did. Right. Yeah. But he still tested them, right? But he, he had, God had helped him. For, but they, they had a hard time with that, you know? And right. so Joseph has to, to speak to them and he has to just encourage them. Listen, um, I have forgiven you. Yes. I don't hold anything against you. Verse 17 of chapter 50. So, Shall you say unto Joseph, Forgive, I pray thee now, the trespass of thy brethren and their sin, for they did unto thee evil. And now we pray thee, forgive the trespass of thy servants, of the God, thy, of, the God of thy father. And Joseph wept when they spake mm -hmm. unto him. Mm -hmm. Why do you think he wept? 
He wept, dude. He said, I'm not, verse, verse uh, 19, I'm not in the place of God. I'm not in the place of God. You did evil against me, but God, verse 20, God Amen. meant it unto good to bring Amen. to pass as it is this day to save much people alive. This is a whole type of the plan of salvation. Friends, God is calling us to forgive. You know, right. Jacob had to forgive. Now think about that. Jacob realizes after 22 years of carrying this burden that probably shortened his life because, you know, mm -hmm. Abraham lived for 175 and Isaac lived for 180. And he's saying, I didn't live as long as them. I'm about ready to die. I'm 130. So all of that, weight of sorrow that he carried. And, and when he realized his brothers had, had done this to him, his brothers, his children had done this to him, he had to forgive them. Mm -hmm. yeah. Jacob had to forgive them. Right. And of course, Joseph had to forgive. And of course, Joseph's brothers had to forgive. But the most difficult forgiveness that they found was to forgive themselves. Mm -hmm. And that's yeah. the hardest thing for that us is, to do yeah. sometimes, isn't it? Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, to actually know that we have been forgiven and to accept that forgiveness. Amen. And this is such a powerful lesson that it's brought out when you contrast Genesis 49, just going back a little bit to sure. Dan, right. right, who's missing in Revelation 7. God is sealing us into his forgiveness. Mm -hmm. The Holy Spirit is sealing us into this forgiveness, into the everlasting gospel, into the forgiveness that we find in Jesus Christ. And those people who hang on to unforgiveness become critical. They become mm -hmm. judgmental. Yeah. Dan is, is, the word Dan means to judge. The word Danielle means God is judge. God mm -hmm. is judge. Right. So Dan is one who judges. He can't let go of that judgmental spirit. He's, mm -hmm. he's like a serpent in the way, an adder in the path mm -hmm. that bites the horse heel so the rider falls backwards. So in spiritual reality and experience, Dan is not in Revelation 7 because that character can't be sealed. Mm. It's not that people in the tribe of Dan aren't going to be in heaven. That's not the point. The point right. God is making is the character of those who are going to be sealed. Mm -hmm. Manassas is there. Manasseh replaces Dan because the word means to remit or to forgive or mm -hmm. to forget, mm -hmm. to let it go. And so God is saying, listen, let that stuff go. I'm going to let it go. You let it go. And therefore, when we see Revelation, we compare it to, to uh, Genesis chapter 49, we see that correlation. We realize, wow, God is speaking. We want to argue, it's the 145 for the 4,000 literal or is it <laughs> symbolic, you know? Well, let's go a little deeper than that. You know, let's just on the surface, let's get deep into the characteristics because yes. all through Revelation, we're talking about character development, the character of the dragon, the character of the lamb. That's what we're talking about mm -hmm. ultimately, right? That's right. And that's what Jacob wants to uh, impress upon his children. And that is also what Joseph wants to bring to the front. In fact, Joseph really is, is uh, re revealing Christ in a sense yeah. mm -hmm. because he's saying, please, You've got to know, I've forgiven you. Mm -hmm. I've forgiven you. This is what Jesus wants us to know through Joseph. I've forgiven you. Please don't, uh, please believe that. Please don't experience unbelief in the fact that I've forgiven you. And here's the last lesson. And this lesson is uh, in verse 24. And then Joseph said unto his brethren, I die and surely God will visit you and he will bring you out into the land under the land which you swear unto Abraham and Isaac and he swear unto Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. And Joseph took an oath, verse 25, of the children of Israel saying, God will surely visit you and you shall carry my bones, carry up my bones from, the land, from hence. Can you imagine that? I mean, when we think about a skeleton, we really want to get scary and down, you know, we put the skull up, you know, people have the skull and the skeleton and the bones were like, yeah, you know. And Joseph is saying, I want you to take my bones out of here. Right. My bones don't belong in Egypt, right? right? Mm -hmm. This reminds us of 1 uh, Corinthians chapter 15. You know, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, God says that the last enemy that is going to be destroyed mm -hmm. is death. Yes, yes. I love this. Death is an enemy and God's going to destroy it. Verse 26 of 1 Corinthians 15. And then he says, verse 51, behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed mm -hmm. in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible mm -hmm. and shall be changed for this corruption must put on incorruption. This corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. Mm -hmm. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, mm -hmm. death is swallowed up in victory. Mm -hmm. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin and the strength of sin is the law, but thanks be to God, which <laughs> gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. We've got to love this because basically right. this is what Joseph is talking about. That's right. He's saying, That's right. my bones are going to be reunited with me <laughs> someday mm. wow. and I want them to be taken to the promised land because my heart and, 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 and my hope is set 
yes. on Canaan, which is again a type, a representation of the new heavens and the new earth. This lesson study closes out with Revelation chapter 21 verses 1 through 4 and just points us, directs us to the hope that we have. The hope that is so glorious that of course it demands our hearts. It demands our goods. It demands everything we have and everything we are, our soul, our might, our strength. Everything is calling us to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Thank you Beautiful. all so much. What an incredible lesson. What an amazing quarterly as we've studied the book of Genesis. I thank you all so much. Give you each a moment to share something about this week. Pastor yes. Donnie. You know, Genesis chapter 47, verse 9, uh, Jacob said uh, that the days of his pilgrimage are 130, few and evil days, he said. But like us, we should as well uh, do as he did and mm -hmm. trust in the Lord mm -hmm. because we are also pilgrims in this world. And 2 Corinthians 4.17 says, This light affliction is uh, working for us a, more far, a far more eternal weight of glory. Mm -hmm. yeah. We should not look at the temporal things. We should look at the things that are eternal. You know, it's interesting because that scripture is when he first came down to meet Pharaoh. Rather pessimistic. Oh, few and evil are my days. And a totally different evaluation in Genesis 48, verse 15, when he's dying, he's recognizing God's been in control all along. And he says, oh, the God who has fed me all my life long to this day, the angel who has redeemed me from all evil. So remember that our perspective needs to be based on faith mm -hmm. in God and what he's done in our lives. Amen. The answer to, the, to sin in the book of Genesis is the Lamb. Yeah. And the answer to sin in the book of Revelation is the Lamb. Mm. And I just want to be one of those, as it says in Revelation 14, 4, about midways there, it talks about these are they, or these are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever he goes. Let us be that. Amen. Amen. Revelation, or excuse me, Genesis chapter 50, verse 21. It says, Now therefore fear ye not, I will nourish you, and your little ones, and he comforted them, and he spake kindly unto them. This is Joseph talking to his brothers who are afraid that they haven't been forgiven, and God wants to nourish us. God wants to speak kindly to us, and he wants us to nourish others and to speak kindly to others. The gospel is practical and it's powerful. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Pastor James, Pastor Ryan, Shelley, and Pastor Johnny. What an incredible lesson. What a joy it's been to journey together through the book of Genesis. I'm reminded of the Hall of Faith, Hebrews chapter 11, and so many of the characters that we have studied in the book of Genesis um, show up here in Hebrews chapter 11. And we see that they died in faith Ha not having received the promise, but having obtained a far off. So the beautiful thing is that they looked forward with eager expectation to a better country, to a better land, knowing that Jesus will write to this world and we can spend an eternity with him. Join us next quarter. This is our third quarter where we study in the crucible with Christ.